Welcome back, Spokane, to another episode of Ever Real Talks. I am your host, Matt Side, and I do not have the lovely Jessica Side with me today, but I do have a special guest that I'm very excited about. I have Dustin Masterson with Numerica Credit Union with me. Dustin, thanks for joining me on this week's episode. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we probably should start off. Here's the reality. Jessica is really the personality on these things. And so she's the one that's always super curious about who you are as a person and what you're interested in and what your background is and where you grew up and all those kind of things. So I'm going to do my best to think like Jessica would think at this moment, but maybe you could just start out by telling uh, us a little bit about who you are, where you grew up, what got you into lending, your background, all that kind of stuff. You, I guess I should tell everybody that you are actually a lender at New American mm-hmm. Credit Union. You yes. Know, uh, work in the branch, but take it away, Dustin. Tell us about yeah. yourself. Yeah, well, definitely. Uh, I'll try to add some color to it as well, you know, the best <laughs> I can to fill that void of uh, Jessica not being here. But uh, yeah, I w- was actually not originally from Spokane, but from a small little town called Yankton, South Dakota. Uh, not too many people know about it unless you watch the TV, you know, the HBO series. I think it was HBO, the Deadwood. You might, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, might hear the name dropped every now and then. But uh, no, my uh, my mother moved us here when I was about four years old, so I've been in Spokane ever since then. I uh, grew up in the valley for the most part. Um, high school wise, I wound up going to East Valley High School. Oh, that's right. We both went to East Valley. Exactly. Yeah, kind of kind of interesting there. But uh, same grade too, same year. Yeah. And wow. then, yeah, then from there, you know, I went to the community college for two years until I tried to figure out what the heck I really wanted to do in life since football was over. And I figured, you know, I was always going to be a star football player. <laughs> Jeans didn't really cut out for that one. So from there, I went to Eastern, graduated from Eastern with, um, you know, a business degree. And then from there, believe it or not, I went into retail. So I went into work for Walmart for uh, almost three years as an assistant branch manager going through my um, rotations to become a store manager or even a, uh, what do you call it, a district manager. Oh, wow. Uh, Yeah, but that was getting, that was just, it wasn't the path I wanted to go. So I already, I had a friend who's already in the banking world and asked me if I wanted to be part of it. And I said, yes, let's do that. And so that has been almost 19 years now. But <laughs> I know, right? That uh, that I made that decision, made the jump over. Um, from there, I've held various positions. Always, always have been a loan officer, but I've been a training manager where we train loan officers from the startup. Um, a programs manager back when I used to go out and work with correspondent lenders to try to bring their products into our credit union back then so that we had multiple offers or things to offer. Okay. From there, I was a private mortgage banker over at, um, you know, Washington Trust for a while. And then I decided I wanted to get back kind of in the roots of doing what I am right now and and uh, pretty much landed back here at a credit union again. Uh, and so I've been happy um, almost four years back at New America Credit Union. Nice. And, uh, honestly, I don't see myself going anywhere else. That's awesome. Yeah. So it, I think it's kind of funny. It's it, life is what it is, right? Like I got into the world of real estate, not because that was necessarily what I wanted to be when I grew up, but, yeah. um, and, and banking specifically. So, you know, my background was at Bank mm-hmm. of America for a while and I was in the call center and I think it was just trying to get away from being on the phones all day that got me into the world of, of finance and banking in the branch world. Uh, but but real estate was always something that was in even in high school I was interested in. But, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that, I appreciate you sharing that. That's that's a very interesting journey. But always in Spokane, like you didn't go anywhere outside to. No, I have I have yet to to venture too far away from Spokane. It's always been within the the county of Spokane. Yeah. All right. So this is this would be a Jessica question. You know, family, like tell us a little bit about your, uh, so you're obviously your mom, is your mom still here in Spokane? Yep, my mother is still here in Spokane with uh, my stepfather who raised me. Uh, my sister is here with her four um, kids, her, her children, and then through those four, I am a, a great uncle uh, four times now. And so, yeah, I know it's kind of, kind of interesting to say I'm a, I'm a great uncle and, you know, only be 44 years old, so... <laughs> 
kind of interesting there. But yes, no, they're, they're still here. Uh, I am um, been married uh, to uh, my very wonderful wife. Uh, this year will wind up being um, 12 years of marriage. Awesome. We have, yeah, we have two kids uh, together. We all have redheads, believe it or not. I mean, we're all redheads. I'm a redhead, if you can really even tell or not. Uh, my wife's a redhead and then obviously both my children. Yeah, they didn't have any hope. Yeah, they, they had no chance. We asked a doctor that once and he just started laughing and then he realized we were being serious. So <laughs> got about, about a 95% chance of being a redhead. So yeah, it was fun. That's awesome. Well, yeah. thanks for sharing all that. So, so today, what, what I, I appreciate you being with us today, because what I wanted to do several weeks ago, um, we started having a conversation from the perspective of the real estate market, because I, I, I had a young, a young kid, I call him a young kid. He's an adult now. He's got a, a kid of his own and, but he grew up with my son, played baseball with my son. So again, this is, as we get older, we call them kids, even though they're adults, but we had a conversation. He asked me, Matt, should I even be like trying to buy a house right now? Like, should I just wait for two years? And, and, you know, you hear the phrase, right? Like everybody's waiting for the crash, the impending doom of the crash. Right. And so we, we addressed it from historical real estate values in Spokane. Uh, and one of the things that we talked about that, uh, I, that really kind of lends itself to a conversation with you is part of the reason that we might see a slowdown, not a crash, but maybe a leveling off of some stuff, a little more balanced market is the potential of increase in interest rates. And if that was the, the reality, I said, well, Cal, if, if the reason that things slow down is because interest rates go up and things have continued to appreciate in the meantime, the real question is, are you going to be ahead of the game? Or if you want to buy a house, should you just buy it now? So talk to me a little bit about kind of from a lender's perspective, the cost to waiting. Um, and I know we're going to do some numbers and we're going to do our best to not like get too deep into the weeds on numbers. But um, so anyway, yeah, talk start talking with me about that yeah, you, yeah well, well definitely i mean you, you as you mentioned i am I'm, I'm hearing this more and more often and, and believe it or not just because of my my kids you know there's lots of conversations that happen during these soccer games and soccer tournaments yeah. when the parents get together and we're all chit-chatting a little bit and you're hearing these people who are talking about it's not just only purchasing right it's also people who are might be doing construction lending as well so they're saying you know with with cost of, of this going up and with this going up uh people are running into, you know, as you know, you've heard this terminology before too, called buyer's fatigue, where they're just tired. Yeah. They're and they're competing, right? They're they're going out there. There's a lot of people who are looking, you know, to purchase. And so they're they're making multiple offers or they're not getting accepted. So after a while they get tired and they say, okay, we're just we're just either going to sit on the fence, wait for the market to slow down and cool off. You know, we've been hearing people say that for what, four or five years now, at least yeah. saying yeah. Let's, let's do that. And or they're going to say, you know, I, I just need to save up more money. I need to have more money for a down payment um, so I can afford more uh, to be able to do this. And a lot of times when I hear people say that, I actually pull out, you know, this, this, these numbers for them and I break it down to where I show them that, you know, there, there is this such thing that's called the cost of waiting, right? And it's not just a salesperson trying to sell you to say, no, we need you to get out there and buy right now because, you know, honestly, it's the best time ever and the rates are low true it really is but the fact that all these different factors that you're losing out on when you decide to wait it's not just yeah, everybody understands you know the price you know the appreciation right yeah you wait the house is going to be worth more right but also you got to you have to factor in okay you just lost appreciation now you're going to also lose it on the interest rate because interest rates are projected to go up so when you lose out on the interest rate what does that do your payment goes up also when you make a monthly payment right? You're losing out on all that principal interest, that principal reduction that you're paying down your loan over that same amount of period of time. So it's not just a little bit you're losing. I mean, you got to look at this. When you buy a house, you got to look at it more as what is this going to do to my worth, right? My net worth, my future um, financial outlook, right? Besides just sitting there saying, you know, we need to save up more money so we can get out there and compete because that's not necessarily going to save you any money. And so, I'm going to do my best, Matt, here to try to go through some of these numbers and not make people's heads spin um, on. I kind of put together a, a scenario for you. Like if somebody were to purchase today with the, the value of a house being worth X, 
let's say you wait six months, a year, two years, even three years down the road to save up, what could you possibly potentially? Yeah. And I think too, just so, so people know what we're going to do is um, if it's okay with you, Dustin, maybe you can yeah. send me a like a PDF of that and we can post it on our website to just say, if you want to see what we're talking about, you can go check that out. Now right. come back real quick before you jump into it. You were talking about loss of appreciation, loss of the principal reduction. Was there a third thing that was kind of a potential negative or were just those two, the main ones we're looking at? Well, there's, there's additional too, because obviously, yeah, you're, you've got your monthly, and I'll go through some of these numbers as well, but okay. you're going to lose monthly cash flow, right? Because your, your value is going up, or not your value, but your, your interest rate's going up, and also your loan amount's going to go up because of appreciation, right? So you're, you're losing that amount as well. And then when you add it all up, you're, you're losing out on total net worth. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. So we really yeah. are looking at not only is the house going to go up in value potentially based on where the market has projected, right. um, you're going to lose principal reduction. Your interest rate is projected to be higher, which means that you're going to be able to afford less yes. in house. And because the appreciation of the real estate, your principal balance on your loan potentially goes up, which would increase your monthly payment as well. So, exactly. okay, cool. Right. So th these numbers that I, I came up with, right, are mainly for educational purposes, but I tried to come up with as realistic as I could. And the interest rate that I'm using, I just need to throw this out there basically as a disclaimer, right? Uh, that this is gonna be based off of, you know, today's interest rates. This is somebody who has, you know, a very well qualified um, buyer. And so the purchase price that I use, I just used a nice even $400,000 as a purchase price. Uh, somebody who is only has 5% to put down as a down payment. And so if we were to sit here and we were to wait, let's say six months, that's the first one I'm gonna basically go over, is the figures I'm using for waiting six months is basically the figures that are coming from the uh, the MBA, right? The Mortgage Brokers Association, yeah. projecting the Spokane County. Now that may be that may vary a little bit from you know like what the local real estate is, but just based off of these numbers that I that I pulled, this is kind of you know what we're what we'd be looking at. And that figure over a six month period, they're saying Spokane County over the next six months is going to see about a six percent appreciation. So let's say somebody today is like, man, I'm just, I'm, I'm fatigued, I'm tired, or I'm going to get this big bonus check towards the end of this, the year, you know, 10, 15,000, who knows however much it's going to wind up being that they want to use, they want to come and they want to be able to try to buy more house. Well, if you were looking at purchasing a house today at $400,000 and you were to wait that six month period, and if we do see a 6% appreciation, it could be more, it could be a little bit less. Right, that four hundred thousand dollar house now is worth about four hundred and twenty four thousand. Right, in, a little, in six months, in a six month period. Right, wow. so you can see right there that's twenty four thousand uh, dollars already. So if we were to then look at you know your down payment, let's say before five percent, today's today's dollars is twenty thousand dollars in six months. You know, it's not a huge jump, right? But that twenty thousand just went to twenty one thousand. You know, right? Not not that big of a deal. Yeah, your here's another one just in a six month period, your monthly principal and interest payment, this isn't your full mortgage payment, because your full mortgage payment is going to have taxes insurance. And then in this case, since this person is only putting down 5%, they're going to have to have what's called monthly private mortgage insurance as well on this on this loan. And so they're just monthly principal and interest payment alone is going to jump up 100 bucks a month. Wow. By just waiting six months, because of that appreciation, if you only put 5% down, their payment's gonna jump up by about you know, $100 a month on that one. And the, um, you know, to look that, you know, just a little bit differently, right? We are looking at, sorry, not $100 a month, it's $110 a month difference, just in the, the total payment difference on there, right? So in a six month period, you're going to lose about $1,300 in an annual cash flow. You know how I was talking about we're going to lose out in cash flow because your payment's going to increase on that one. And then the appreciation, we already saw that they lost about $24,000 in appreciation just in that six-month period. Now, that amortization, when I said you're making a monthly payment, 
right? And that monthly payment, part of it's going to paying down your principal of what you owe on the loan. The amortization that you would have lost in just that six month period, right, is about $3,700. Wow. You would have lost. So in a six months, when you add all that up, right, you're basically, your cost to wait, or if you want to say your cost to waste, in a, in a sense, uh, it's about $28,000 just over that six month period that you potentially could have lost or gained by buying today versus waiting. So for that person to say, you know, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to wait and save $10,000, $15,000 just so that they could put more down on it, right? Well, you just saw right there, yeah, that, that cost weight's $28,000. So I mean, that already outweighs that factor on that one. And if we want to take that farther, let's say what, I'm just going to jump, jump ahead to three years. How's that sound? Yeah, that works. Okay. So if we were talking about jumping ahead three years, and once again, we're looking at today's dollars of four, 400,000 in three years, the, you know, the compounding of the appreciation on today's dollar, that 400,000 will now be worth $19,000 or 19,000, I'm sorry, 19% more in appreciation. So that house in three years potentially could be worth about $476,000. And I'll just pause right there because I, these numbers are not, I, I mean, these are reasonably conservative numbers, I would say. Exactly. Like, right. Because we, we've seen over 12% appreciation every year since for the last five or six or more. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's um, and I don't, I don't have that number right in front of me, but to, to say a 12% annual increase in your real estate values right now is not like pie in the sky. Yeah, it, it, exactly right. Like you, you're, you're saying that these are conservative and the NBA is normally always very conservative when it comes to their numbers. Uh, a lot of times they're actually below historical figures. If I were to, to go in and use a historical figure, then yeah, these numbers would be a whole, a whole heck of a lot higher um, in, in that case. But if we were just to stick with these conservative numbers, right, uh, for comparison, you know, 400,000, 476,000, you know, in, in the future in that three year, year period your interest rate wise, right? I didn't even bring up. So all these figures I'm basing this off of are with today's rate of, let's say 3.25 on a conventional loan, right? Um, APR 3.54, where they're projecting the interest rates to go between now and the next three years, that rate would increase to 4.375. So almost one and an eighth higher in rate. And so oh. that does, yeah, exactly. So what that does to the payment wise, right? I mean, we obviously know right off the bat, I mean, that's gonna be pretty significant, right? Your payment just increased $633 over that year period. That's still, if you're only coming up with 5% down. So that's assuming that I wait three years to buy. Correct. The appreciation, that $400,000 house is likely to be selling at 476 with those conservative numbers. And then with an increased interest rate, my monthly payment going out just jumped by 600 bucks for basically the same house. Exactly, for the same house. Uh, so how that looks, your annual cash flow, again, it's about $7,600 difference that you're losing. I mean, that's, that's pretty substantial, right? And then if we were to look at this in the sense of um, your monthly payment to pay down your, uh, basically the appreciation, I'm sorry, not the appreciation, but the amortization. So your amortization lost over that time period is just under $24,000 is what wow. you wind up losing. The appreciation, that's simple, you know, 76,000. So again, over a three year period, when you add all that up and like we were saying, these are conservative numbers, your, your net worth, basically, you just lost $100,000. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, uh, at this moment, like to let the listeners take that in. And I think it is also really important what Dustin said at the beginning, this is not like a salesperson trying to talk you into something. And if you've listened to our episodes uh, over the last couple of years, you know that we're not here to talk a client into doing something that's not good for them. And just mm -hmm. because you lose $100,000 in equity over the next three years doesn't mean that based on your life situation that it's still better to wait because of where you are in life. But I think that this, what this really, where what we're trying to utilize this information for is to help that person that's on the fence saying, hey, I'm, I want to buy a house. Like I'm going to buy a house. I'm just trying to figure out 
is it better for me to buy today or is it better for me to buy three years from now? And that's where these numbers come in. It's not trying to, to create this panic of, oh my God, I've got to buy a house, I've got to buy a house. It's waiting is not going to help you based on history. And, and one of the numbers I shared, Dustin, when we talked about this a few weeks ago is since 1984, in the Spokane, when as Spokane's multiple listing service has tracked median increase or decrease in real estate values in Spokane, other than the Great Recession, where we had uh, a couple of like an eight and a five and a four negative, like a couple of years in a row, we had some negatives yeah. there. Right. It was only one year since 1984 that we had both we had a negative uh, median sales price, like it went down every other year. Even if it was small, it had some sort of an increase. So there's not, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm repeating what I said a few weeks ago, but the reality is, is even if three or four years from now, we have a, a rollback, it's it's not a significant, historically speaking, it wouldn't be a significant enough rollback to get rid of the appreciation that you would have gained. Yeah, well, true. And if you don't mind, if I take it a step further, you know, I am not a financial advisor, right? But what I do like to show some people is how you can continue to make your money grow for you. So in this case, let's say, you know, that difference of what we were showing between today's payment and three years down the road, you know, $633. Let's say this is, oh. a, you know, 5% down. They really don't have a whole heck of a lot that they, that they are using for, um, let's say like an IRA account. Right. They don't have really they really don't have a savings account saved up. So let's say over that six year period that let's say you only put four hundred dollars a month. Right. You. You know, you put four hundred dollars a month. I'm going to go with a real modest. Um, gain here. And so and what I mean by that one is I'm going to use a five percent gain, like if you were to invest in the market today. Um, or let's say an IRA account and you get 5% return every single year for, for the next, you know, three years. And oh. I'm pretty sure you, you talk to any financial advisor. They're saying I'm being extremely conservative with these factors or with these numbers. Right? Pause for one second. Your audio is kind of going in and out a little bit. So I want to come back to, because I can kind of tell what you're saying and I don't know that all our listeners can hear. So what you're saying is you're plugging in a conservative return on some form of an investment, like an IRA or, or an investment account of 5%. Is that what you said? Exactly. Right. Okay. And so if we were to say, let's just say, not using that full 633, let's just say $400 a month. $400 a month for three years over, you know, with the, with your, um, a gain of 5%, that is going to give you an additional $25,000. Right. Wow. So if you take in what we were saying, that $100,000 that you're going to wind up that you potentially could lose. Um, by waiting, plus this an additional investment. I mean, that really turns out to be you know, one hundred twenty-five thousand dollar difference, uh, right there. Wow! So, and that's so. Yeah. And it's, it's the the beautiful thing about real estate is it is absolutely an opportunity to build wealth. And what this is doing is kind of almost like a life hack on some level, saying, "Hey, instead of waiting and then having the potential to have an increased monthly mortgage payment for the same house." Why don't you tighten the belt today and buy the property at the four hundred thousand dollar price, if you will, and then take some of that extra that you would have been paying if you waited and reinvest that? Um, it's kind of the same strategy for people that have taken advantage of all these extremely low interest rates to refinance yeah. their property. On the refinancing side of it, you exactly. take the difference, right? I'm going to save three hundred bucks a month. Well, I'm going to put that three hundred bucks a month into a retirement account or something like that. Right. Exactly. Exactly right. I mean, it's this is the same concept I, I go through with people on the refinance side of it too. If they want to know, does it make sense to, you know, to pay off debt? Does it not? I mean, if rates are going, does it make sense for me to refinance? Yeah, these are all strategies, you know, that I like to look at for people and kind of show them, you know, whatever their their goal is. If it's short term, two, three years. If it's fifteen years down the road, to kind of show them if they were to strategize, you know, potentially what it could be looking like for them. That's really good. I'll just yeah. throw this out to you that I know that you're very open. If anybody wanted to actually sit down and analyze this, that you've got not just the the image that we'll put out on our social media, but you could like plug in their real numbers and their real situation and the computer will generate a return, you know, basically spit out the numbers that yeah. they got. Exactly. 
that's cool. That's that's really powerful. And I that's one of one of the re- why I wanted to bring you on, right? Is because I can see yes. it from just the appreciation standpoint of listen, if we have 10% appreciation over the next two years, and even if we had like an 8% drop, which was the highest decrease we saw in the Great Recession, you're still up in appreciation. But I knew in conversations with you that there was a, a an additional approach to the financing piece of it. Um, so the potential of a hundred plus thousand, and that's just over three years, right? Now, yeah. take it beyond that. If you live in your house for seven to 10 years and you're paying 600 bucks a month more for that same house for a 10 year period, now you're talking a whole bunch of money Mm -hmm. um, that you could have done something else with. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And, you know, to kind of go back to it, you know, I'm going to bring up a a quick story of a recent um, couple that just and and you know who they are, um, but I'm not going to obviously see who they are. But um, to where we were, we were actually just all chatting around um, through a Zoom call. And I kind of heard that conversation of, yeah, we're, we're going to sit back, we're waiting um, to purchase. And then I was able to, you know, reach out to her and let her know that, hey, this is what it's going to look like if you were to do the cost of waiting. So they, they looked at those numbers and they realized, you know, it was, a, it was a huge eye opener. They went out there. I'm now saying this is typical, right? But they were fortunate enough that like with one of the first couple of the houses they looked at, they're actually able to make an offer, get the, get the house. They're in the house. They're extremely excited about it. And they have a place now, instead of waiting that year, two years down the road, when it was going to be more difficult for them because of, you know, where we've seen everything going. Yeah, no, that's really powerful. I appreciate you sharing all this. Um, so let's talk. So let's talk a little bit about, because we've, we've talked on the show before people are hearing it in the news like inflation. I mean, does that come into account too? Like if my goal is, well, I'm going to sit around for a couple of years and I'm going to save up a bigger down payment. Like at what point does inflation have something to do with like, and I guess the appreciation of the real estate, right? That's part of right. the, the inflation number. Those dollars are buying me less house. Um, how else does that in your world of lending inflation, mortgage rates? Like what, what are you guys seeing out there concerned about, curious about? Yeah, well, with the inflation, I mean, the biggest thing that's impacting are interest rates, right? Uh, interest rates hate inflation. And without going too deep into an economic lessons on how mortgage interest rates are actually, uh, can, you know, how the, the, the rates are impacted, right? That a lot of times people hear about the Federal Reserve talking about that, hey, we're going to raise interest rates. Everyone automatically thinks, well, that's every interest rate across the board. You know, that's really what's called the retail side of it, right? It's what the banks borrow money against the Federal Reserve window for more towards like credit cards, for car loans, for home equity sure. credits, but they're not mortgage rates, right? For the first, first mortgage. Uh, those are impacted by what's called the mortgage-backed security market. So they're actually traded on the free market, just like we're talking about you know, in the stock market. And the stock market is out there and they're trading with investors. So you've got competition, right? For investments, so you've got, securities out there, you've got other bonds, you've got the stocks that are out there and they're competing with mortgage-backed securities. And when there's inflation talks, a lot of investors don't really like, you know, the the, the form of inflation. So what they do is they start selling what are called these mortgage-backed securities and buying them in other type of, you know, interests uh, and securities. And by selling these mortgage-backed securities, what that does is it then will increase the rates. Um, so the rates will start to go up and those rates are really passed on to lenders through Fannie Mae, through Freddie Mac, through FHA, you know, be it places like our you know, entities, these government sponsored entities, uh, pass those rates on to the lenders and obviously then those rates go up. So that's really what is happening right now with inflation projections, you know, it's, it's, you know, I always say my, my crystal ball is cloudy when it comes to trying to project anything in this market, especially when it comes to the interest rates and that. But short term wise, I mean, this could, from what some top analysts are talking about, with inflation numbers going up, inflation will have a tendency of sometimes putting the economy into a, you know, a mild recession. And Justin, gonna... real quick, like we're yeah. about to run out of time for okay. the live radio. Um, we're going to continue the conversation on our podcast. If you want to catch the back end of this, just 
jump on and find Every Real Talks on your podcast channel. Uh, we will be back next week. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in and um, have a great Saturday. We'll talk to you next week. All right. See you, everybody. So now well, let's let's keep the conversation rolling about interest rates and, and inflation. Yeah. Where you're, sorry, you're interrupting there. Yeah, well, definitely. So, yeah, where I was going with that one is with, you know, infl- with inflation, inflation has a tendency of kind of driving towards recessions a little bit, right? And that's where they're kind of predicting that sometime next year could be the first quarter, second, third quarter next year, where we're going to see we're in a recession. And a lot of times, by the time that we realize we're in a recession, recession, right, we've already been in it. And so with recessions, have the opposite of impact on interest rates. Interest rates generally will dip during recessions. So right now, uh, short term, and when I always say short term, I just mean like 12 months type of a, a short term period, but the rates are predicted to con- continue going up. The inflation numbers and readings have been kind of a slow driving force on mortgage rates. Not they haven't been going up drastically, but yes, they have been going up just a little bit at a time. You know, it's been a slow climb, but uh, this was all um, um, projected and predicted towards the beginning of the year. And that's kind of what we're seeing that, that we'll see them going up. We'll probably see a leveling off uh, towards the end of the year, maybe by the end of the third quarter, sometime in the fourth quarter where we're leveling off with the rates going up. And then we could see a small uh, dip next year. So with the rates going up now, it's not always a bad thing because we could see a dip next year a little bit, which could give, you know, potential more people to do um, some more refinancing. No, that's good. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, let's, let me ask you this. Do you have time to jump in a little bit to uh, kind of, because I know you do a ton in new construction mm-hmm. and um, wonder if we could just kind of talk about what you're seeing with your clients out there that are thinking of building, because that is definitely something um, that as a, real estate broker for people that are not finding what they need, maybe we can find them a piece of dirt that they can build on. But I also know that we've been hearing about crazy construction costs. And I know as a lender, you've been dealing with some of that stuff. Like what's, um, what are you seeing and how are people handling? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I mean, when we're looking at it, it's, you talk to anybody in the industry, and what I mean by that, it's not just myself, or it's not just realtors or builders. Uh, you know, a lot of conversations you get it straight from the builders, but it's the suppliers to the builders too. You know, it's the subs, it's everybody else. We're all seeing the same thing, and obviously, every area is completely different, just depending on you know labor for one, and and supply. But what we are seeing, on on average, we are seeing uh, people who may have came and talked to me, you know, six months ago, eight months ago, a year, because it's, it's a process when somebody says, Hey, I'm ready to build. I'm like, great. Now you need to go out and, you know, talk to a builder, start talking to, you know, get, get everything lined up. It's a, it's a draw. It's a process. Some people are great and they can get it done super quick, but you know, most people it's, you know, it's six months to a year, if not longer, this process of first you talk to me and then you're starting to work things out with the builder and with COVID and everything else that's happened. I mean, that's really driving that those those waiting periods for people even longer and it's taken um these prices for a home uh i'm seeing them going anywhere between you know thirty thousand up to like sixty thousand dollars a jump in lumber prices so somebody who thought i'm just again i'm just like that number 400 right Four hundred thousand. let's say you got a four hundred thousand dollar bill well now you could be looking anywhere between 430 to 460 thousand dollars you know now in a build because of the cost of everything that's gone up and wow. Well, yeah, and it's there's all kinds of things that are impacting. It's not just necessarily you know a shortage of lumber because those lumber um, mills and stuff are starting to produce to where people are, you know, where where they can meet demand. But the problem is too is you've got your suppliers too. I mean, the, there's there's a shortage of people who can even transport uh, all of this, which is causing the prices to go up and to continue to go up. And it does cause obviously delays because of, as we all hear every single day in the news, there's, there's a labor shortage. I'm not a labor shortage, but uh, there's plenty of jobs that are out there that are not being filled. And so when people start going back to work, you're going to see all this eventually get back to normal. And I do yep. predict prices to drop back down when it comes to the cost of construction. But when, you know, we don't, we don't know at all when that's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. 
Yeah, but yeah, that's definitely what 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 we're seeing uh, with the 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 time the turn time. So let's say a normal build four months to six month build time, where we're seeing eight months plus uh, for for to for the builds. And again, it's because like appliances could take a couple months just to order your appliance and get appliance, right? So when somebody goes to build a house, let's say they pour the foundation and I got to wait for lumber. So that might take an extra week or two longer than what they thought. It could be even longer, it might not have any delay on it, but then they get that. And then, then I got to wait for, you know, the siding and the windows and then all the other materials that come in. Yeah. And so it's just drawing it out. It's taking a little bit longer. Um, yeah, I was talking to somebody just the other day that was, they're, they're fur doing a furnished um, rental and they ordered uh, a sleeper couch in November of 2020, and it still hasn't arrived. Yeah, and, uh, it just it, the supply chains and stuff are just still really crazy. No, that's I've got a I've got a story like that myself. But uh, what we are doing, as you know, through the credit union for this, right, is you know our construction loan. Of course, I'm going to tout it and say it's you know one of the best out there, um, and it is a fantastic program. But we have made a few changes to help. Uh, the, you know, our members to hopefully not run into any major surprises to where you know, after we close a loan and we've already set a price and this is what we're funding, yeah. then their prices do escalate because the lumber price is 30, 40 grand and the builder's coming back and saying, you know, hey, Mr. You know, homeowner or Mrs. Homeowner, the prices just went up and I can't absorb it. We need you to pay for it and they don't have the funds to do it, or maybe it cleans out all their money to do it, then they're trying to come back to us to ask us to see if there's anything that we can do to help them. You know, for that particular loan itself, there's not, because it's already been through underwriting, it's already been recorded, right? And we've already entered into a contract and we're moving forward without doing that, you know, by increasing that, we've got to start completely from scratch. Mm -hmm. You know, the possibilities of doing that's just really hard. So we do try to get creative. I can't say we've been able to help everyone, but we have gotten creative through other avenues outside of, financing, you know, that construction loan to help them come up with that. But what we've done in the, in the interim turn right now, right, is we're really looking at people's financial pictures a little bit deeper. And we're helping them out too by adding a contingency to the loan. Before it was optional. Now we are just going to require the contingency. We, we actually, before we decided to do this, we went and we talked to almost every builder that we've done business with. And we've reached out to them and we've asked, are you guys building contingencies in there? Or what do you think it would happen if we put a mandatory contingency in there? Meaning for any cost overrun, not because of somebody said that, I mean, it would work for this, but for the most part, it's not for someone who went from, you know, a certain type of countertop to now all of a sudden it's top of the line countertop and it just increased it by five grand. That's not in what the contingency is really intended for. Sure. It's for those cost overruns. Like an excavator goes out there and they start digging, they hit a rock. Now their excavation prices go up or the lumber prices go up or window prices because of right prices going up, you know, things like that. So that's one thing that we've done, you know, to step in to, to help out with that. And if you don't mind, I'm going to that that contingency, right? How it would work is if let's say you build the house and you don't need the contingency or you barely use any of it, we're not going to make you borrow that contingency. When everything is said and done, you're only truly going to borrow what you've lent on we're not going to force you to borrow a higher a higher amount what what i'm hearing is that you're basically trying to pre-approve your borrower for a percentage increase for those potential unforeseen increases and then right. that way if it happens they're not stuck with a half a built house and a bank that's not going to finish the loan right and uh, but they don't have to pay on like they don't have to get the full amount they'll they'll get whatever the cost is if yeah, it's it, Exactly right. And since they haven't borrowed it, you know, they're not paying any interest on it. Right. So it's, it's not costing them any more up front or even through the construction phase because they haven't borrowed it yet. Got so, it. So Got I know it. a lot of people are like, well, you're going to make me, you know, have this contingency. I'm going to have a higher payment. I'm going to have to, you know, pay all this interest and I'm never going to use it. And that's not the case. You only pay on what you borrowed, you know, each month up to that point. That makes that makes a ton of sense that makes a ton of sense that's and uh so i'll toot your horn also because i really think the products that numerica um has are pretty incredible especially in the world of, of construction you've got a ton of experience working with these builders and with people that are building yeah i will i will just say 
you're, you're the guy I called a couple years ago when my clients who were had chosen to get a construction loan through a different lender who shall remain uh, unnamed. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah. Fire engine. Figured we'd just pause there. Um, yeah. You know, so I, I was like, hey, this is what's going on. I know you know construction loans. Can we get on a conference call? And you spent 10 or 15 minutes kind of helping my client get an idea of what was happening and what they could do, like the right questions to ask their lender. Um, and I mean, that's just the kind of person that you are. You're, you're giving yeah. up your information. And well, thank uh, you. Um, so, anyway, um, yeah. so if you have construction questions, I think you should reach out to Dustin. We'll, of course, put all his contact information on our social media channels. Last question as we kind of wrap this up here, Dustin, what made you, so you had a history, you went credit union, you went into banks, you know, what is a difference, if you will, like, why did you choose a credit union over a bank or a mortgage brokerage? And um, I'm just kind of curious that, like, is there a difference for you? Is there a difference for the consumer that then helps you do your job better? Like why a credit union? Well, it, a lot of it happens to deal with personal preference right for one um but when it comes to the like for myself i like being able to have a little bit more hands-on when it comes to the decision making it doesn't necessarily mean i'm allowed to make the decision but the thing is is that underwriters right outside my door they're, they're less than 15 feet outside my door yeah so if there's a question i'm in the office they'll come into my office right and they'll talk to me and say hey let's let's work this through it's not just an email that says denied you know, times and suspend it. And then I was trying to figure it out. They try to seriously as, as the best they can to help the member, right? Because uh, credit unions are member owned. They're not shareholders, right? They are actual a member and own the credit union. So we do everything we can to service them the best we can. Uh, I mean, that's just, that's just one thing. Now, another thing, you know, when I, when I talk about personal preference, when it comes to a member, other than, you know, knowing that everybody here is a team and we're not divided, you know, we don't have these walls divided between, you know, each little, um, you know, category within the mortgage business, right, is the fact that, you know, we service our own loans, so, so they stay in house, we don't sell them, right, some people really like the fact that they can do that, that they can still pick up the phone, even though when I close a loan, right, and it goes off to a servicing department, it doesn't mean I'm done with you, you can call me and say, hey, I've got questions on my servicing, I can still jump in and I can help out with that. Yeah, that's that's versus, awesome. Yeah, and versus you know some some banks are that way. A lot of banks aren't. Not every credit union is the same way, right? Sure. I mean, they they may not retain. They may not service. Same with you know the larger um, banks as well. Uh, and then same with um, but you know like when you're when you're talking to broker world, most of them are correspondent, and they do wind up most of them will wind up selling their loan. And when you talk to your loan officer about it, they're like, yeah, we can't help you. You gotta you know call whoever whoever owns your loan now. So, I mean, those are the biggest things. I mean, I've got all kinds of other things, you know, on a personal side, why I feel more comfortable with a credit union, but it just happens to feel um, like family when you're at a credit union. I mean, it just always really feels like people are watching out for each other and not watching out for just the bottom line. Yeah, that's good. It's kind of, it's, it's like the difference between going to REI and going to another sporting goods store. Yeah. It's, exactly. you know, there's, there exactly. tends to be that yeah. feeling of, we're all in this together, kind of a, it's your store too. Right, yeah, so, exactly. And I will say from experience, uh, I mean, I, we, we obviously just don't invite anybody onto this, um, this program. So the fact that we are bringing you on and interviewing you and promoting you means that we have our own, a lot of great experience with the credit union. And I think for myself as a consumer, one of the things I absolutely love about the credit union is the fact that they're like real people making real decisions. And even your comment on the underwriter, right? Like they, they realize the goal is to help them, help, help the member accomplish their goals, protect the credit union, obviously, but, um, but it's not just a stamp denied, you know, figured out loan officer in a different right. part of the country. Like, cause they know if they aren't good at communicating with what's going on, you are going to walk out there and be like, Hey, what the heck, man? Like I, <laughs> you got to help me out here. Why, yeah. why did you deny this? And, and in your experience, nearly 20 years of experience, obviously right. like you can look at a deal and say, mm, here's some issues we're going to be running into. Let's try to yeah. resolve these. Yeah. So anyway, 
Well, I appreciate your time, Dustin. Thank you for your expertise. I do invite any of our listeners that are interested um, to reach out to Dustin. Uh, you can find his contact information on our social media. You probably could Google New America Credit Union, Dustin Masterson. I'm sure he will pop up. I will. But um, he will, he, again, he is a giver. He wants to give you information just like we are. We want you to make the best decision for you. So if you want to run numbers on a refinance, you want to run numbers on the cost of waiting to purchase, um, you know, any of the things that we've talked about today, reach out to Dustin and he will hook you up. Dustin Masterson, thank you again for being with us. Hey, you better appreciate it, Matt. And this is our official sign off. Uh, thanks everybody. Um, for those of you that jumped over from the radio to the podcast, uh, this is the end of Ever Real Talks. If you have any questions about real estate, you can reach out to us at 509-62-HOUSE. Uh, you can search us on any of the social channels. Just type in E-V-O-R-E-A-L. And until next week, this is Matt Side and uh, Dustin Masterson signing off. Everybody have a good yeah. week. All right. Goodbye.